this video, we'll be looking at plant growth and development. So we'll be looking at this in terms of a more general process and then looking at how the different hormones are actually involved in each stage of development and growth. So here you can see the general timeline, so to speak, is that we start off with the seed germination after fertilization, and then we'll go into cell elongation uh, about how individual plant cells would start to grow bigger and then uh, leading on to the growth of the whole plant of uh, apical dominance and stem elongation, which pretty much happens um, you know, at the same time in terms of the whole plant growth. So like I said, in each of these stages, we'll look at uh, exactly what do each hormone uh, or, or which hormone is actually involved in each, each stage and how they actually facilitate that particular uh, stage. And uh, we will also look into a bit more details in terms of how cell elongation specifically happens. So first of all, let's start off with uh, seed germination. So in seed germination, um, gibberellins are the key plant hormones that are involved in this particular stage. So what gibberellins do is that they stimulate um, digestive enzymes to be made. And what they do is that they would stimulate that in the food store. So this could be, for example, in fruits or any tubers. So for example, in um, carrots or potatoes would be a big one. And these food stores would store uh, starch in them, um, which is made up of glucose, which is the key uh, chemical that is broken down in respiration for energy for lots of different things. So what gibberellins do is that they would stimulate the production of these digestive enzymes, which will then, for example, amylase, then they would be at the food store to break that starch down into glucose, and then the glucose would then um, be broken down through, let's say, aerobic respiration to release energy. And the concept is why is that important? And as you would know, energy is important for growth. So the idea is that the energy released would uh, allow the seedling to grow. So gibberellins is responsible for this particular stage. Then uh, as the seedling starts to grow, then obviously the seedlings is made up of, can start making different cells. And then the cells themselves need to become bigger in order to contribute to the growth of the whole plant. Now in cell elongation, it's a little bit more complicated. And the key, uh, um, and, um, key hormone here is auxins. And then now we're gonna look at how auxins actually work to facilitate this. So let's imagine that this is kind of the, um, the tip section of a, of a seedling, of a shoot. So there are different zones here. Right? So the first top bed, we have the meristems. So this is where uh, they are. these are stem cells of a plant. And then we have the zone of elongation which as the name implies is where the plant cells actually grow. And then finally, once they are of a appropriate size, then we have the zone of differentiation when the cell actually can start to differentiate into different cell types for different functions. So it's important to know that meristems exist in the tip of the shoots and also tip of the roots. So we facilitate different parts of the plant. And also they can be found uh, sometimes in the vascular bundles as well in the xylem, between the xylem and the phloem. So here I've drawn um, five meristematic cells on the top there, just for simplicity sake. Uh, and what I'm going to do later on is as I, as I go down the zone of elongation, I'm just going to draw what happens to one cell, but you can see how it would happen to all of the different cells. All right, so the first thing is that I mentioned this in an overview video is that auxins are released by the meristem, right? So these cells would produce um, auxins that would diffuse as a chemical does uh, down the shoot to areas of lower concentration. So imagine these blue dots are the auxins, right? So they diffuse further down the uh, further down the shoot. And let's say that there are obviously other cells that are in the zone of elongation. Here, I'm just going to draw one of them. So in the very beginning, a cell is very simplistic. You got the cell, mem the plasma membrane. You got the nucleus. You got the cell wall. Um, and there is also a little uh, receptor. What these receptors do is that they are receptors for auxins. So these auxins can bind to the receptor. And once they bind to it, it, the receptor could be coupled with a different protein. It could be coupled with a protein channel. And once the auxins bind to these receptors, they would uh, allow uh, 
hydrogen ions which exist outside this area to be pumped into the cells. So let's say here are some protons or um, hydrogen ions to move into the actual cell itself. Now, as you know that a cell is made up of, it's got the plasma membrane on the outside. For plant cells, they have a cell wall. And the cell wall is made up of cellulose and the whole cellulose cell wall gives the plant cell its shape and maintains the shape. And if there is a lot of water that goes into the cell, then um, it the plant cell will become turgid um, instead of bursting like it would do in an animal cell which does not have a cell wall. Now in this case, however, as the hydrogen ions are pumped into the cell, it would decrease the pH levels inside the cell. And this low pH would cause the cell wall to become more flexible. It means that it's allowed to change its shape or its size. Um, you don't need to know it in detail, but to give you a bit more insight, the um, low pH actually activates some of the enzymes that exist inside the cell, which kind of break some of the hydrogen bonds uh, that is found between the different cellulose fibers in the cell wall. So this is why the cell, uh, the cell wall itself actually becomes more flexible and less rigid. But in this case, it's actually a good thing, right? In normal cases, it's bad, but this case is good because that means that uh, if any other water molecule is in the area, so for example here, when they move into the cell, it would expand without completely bursting like as it would uh, in an animal cell, it would expand the cell wall. In the same time, uh, other components also start to grow. So for example, um, smaller vacuoles can also start to form to store those extra water. Uh, in this case, the oxygen is still bound to the actual cell itself. So eventually the cell elongates, becomes bigger. And you can see that there is now a full permanent, uh, large permanent vacuole inside as well. Now, as the cell matures, um, there is less oxygen around and there are also enzymes that break oxygens down. So the oxygen will actually leave the receptor and then it's usually there will be some, some sort of enzyme there to break it down. And because there, the oxygen no longer is um, activating or opening the protein channel, uh, the protein channel closes and stops further entry of the, of the hydrogen ion. And in that case, the pH level actually rises back to normal levels. The cell wall uh, becomes rigid again and not flexible anymore. The cell shape is, um, is basically set at that point so it's not going to change anymore so the cell is now mature and as it continues on further down into the zone of differentiation then obviously the plant cell might change its shape to become different types of cells but other than that the shape uh, the, the size is the, the cell size is pretty much set so just to see how um, the cell elongation actually works so number one auxins are released by the meristems at the tip of the shoot the auxins then bind to the receptors on cell surface membranes of the uh, subsequent cells. This causes protons or hydrogen ions to be pumped into the cell, um, which causes the pH in the cell to become lower. And this low pH would cause the cell wall to become more flexible, meaning when the cell absorbs the water, it would expand the cell wall. And in this case, it, the cell would then elongate and become bigger. Eventually, as the cell matures, the cell wall becomes rigid again as the auxins are removed and, broke, and, and, and is broken down by enzymes. So this is cell elongation. So after cell elongation, we will start looking at how the whole plant actually grow and become more mature. So the two things that will happen at the same time is apical dominance and stem elongation. So in apical dominance, first of all, um, the main hormone is auxins here. So for apical dominance, the auxins actually promote apical shoot growth. So the apical shoot is referring to um, the, the main shoot that grows upwards, the main stem, if you would like. The lateral shoots are referring to the uh, shoots that grow sideways, so the stem that grows off of the main branch, so the side branches. And auxins, which are made in the tip of the shoot, would promote the apical shoot growth going upwards, but then it would limit the lateral shoot growth. So you can see the lateral shoots that are near where the auxins are made, so where the concentration of auxins is the highest, the lateral shoots are much smaller than further down the apical shoot when the auxin concentration is much, much lower. 
And for this one, one of the key things is that um, it actually allows all of the different shoots to uh, better compete for light. So the ones near the top, obviously they're the first ones that gets the light. Now, if the lateral shoots near the top are actually much, much longer that go sideways, it might cover up the light. Uh, so it might stop light to actually go further down the shoot. So the ones on the bottom, the lateral shoots on the bottom, might not actually get enough light for growth. So this actually allows all of the different shoots throughout the whole plant, even those near the bottom, also get some light um, for photosynthesis to occur. So it means that the plant is better compete uh, in a better position to compete for light. Now, together with stem elongation, which would make the plant even uh, better for absorbing light. So for the stem elongation is uh, mainly the uh, hormone is gibberellin. So again, I mentioned this in a in a in a different video when I was talking about the old view. It's always about plant hormone balance. So it's not about the presence of a hormone, but it's about the concentration of the hormone. So in this case, um, the con if you have a high concentration of gibberellins, then you are promoting stem elongation. Uh, specifically, you are making longer internodes. So if you have longer internodes, you have longer stem elongation, then you get taller plants. Then together in the same concept, both the apical dominance and having taller plants is about making the plant better compete for light. And the more light the plant gets, the more photosynthesis it can do. That means more glucose, more food stores for them to grow. Having said that, uh, farmers sometimes actually would try to limit uh, stem elongation. Sometimes farmers won't necessarily want a lot of stem because not all crops, um, we don't always eat the stem of crops in general. So if, if the plant is um, really, really tall, but uh, we don't actually eat those uh, those bits, then there's kind of no point. And actually, there would be extra energy used to make uh, to to grow those stems instead of maybe the fruits, which is or the flowers, which is what the farmers would want. So sometimes farmers would want to have uh, plants that are maybe perhaps genetically engineered to have less gibberellins, for example, so that you're reducing the waste uh, that is produced. Um, in the process that farmers don't want uh, and sometimes actually it could also prevent crop damage by uh, poor weather because if the plants are too tall then they might and if it's let's say if there's a windy condition then they're more prone to be damaged by the bad weather and which is what farmers obviously don't want so the idea is that the more we know about how plant hormones work, the better um, the farmers would be able to maybe control the conditions of the plant to allow better crop yield. So there you have it. This is uh, plant growth and development in the different stages, starting from a uh, so very, very quick overview. So we start with seed germination by gibberellins that stimulate enzymes to uh, release the glucose from fruit stores so that the seeds can actually germinate. And as the seeds grow, you can start to have cell elongation uh, because the oxygen are produced from the meristems, which promotes the cell to become bigger. Then as the cells become big enough, then you can start having apical dominance happening where the oxys, oxins would promote more growth of the apical shoots, whereas inhibiting lateral shoot growth, together with stem elongation where you can make the plant taller by having more gibberellins there. So the idea is that allowing the plant to compete uh, better for light, for more photosynthesis, so that it can start making its own food to uh, sustain its growth. So this is plant growth and development.